studio and looking around. We're at the, the studio of Eleanor Brooks in Llanrothen. Um, I've chosen Domier's Le Fado, which means the burden, and it's, of, I think, a laundress, probably. I think what she's got in her burden is a bag of washing that she's going to do for someone better off than herself and get paid for it. And she's hurrying her, obviously hurrying. The burden is obviously very heavy. She's resting it on her hip as much as she can, um, not just on her back or on her arm. She's using one arm to hold the blanket, the, the basket, I mean, the handle of the basket goes over one arm, and then the hand of the other arm is holding the hand of the first arm. So she's making a big strong loop of her arms to carry this burden, and you can, you can tell by the way she's standing that it's very heavy. And um, what I love about it is that it's so simple, it's so uh, eloquent, it speaks. Uh, you can tell all this, you can tell so much about her, that this simple little painting, um, it's very hard to, to say. Uh, you know, to put one's finger on the secret. I mean, the secret really is that the man obviously looked at things hard all the time and practiced so much that he could get it done quickly and easily, what he wanted. He thought of himself as a failure as an artist because he never managed to uh, sort of make smart finished pictures and he his colour palette was very restricted, it was just a few earth colours. Um, I think really earth, um, uh, yellow, brown and, and a bit of red, sometimes a blue, sometimes a bit of blue, but not often. And of course mostly he was known and made his living as a journalist. Um, so he was in the protest business, he was mocking the rich, the hypocrites, the, the powerful, the corrupt, and so on. It was part of his business. Um, but he sometimes mocked um, the poor too. There's one where the in set in a law court, a drawing set in a law court, where the advocate has just um, got his his man off, uh, defended him successfully. And <laughs> the man is, is picking his pocket or cutting his purse away, <laughs> cutting the advocate's purse away. He hasn't been reformed. Mm -hmm. Conscience. Yes, the social conscience, that's, I think, why I was interested in trying to do it, because I've always felt that I ought to be able uh, uh, to try and express some of my social conscience in painting, but I haven't ever managed to do so really in in a, a special, you know, a single piece. I suppose in some ways Mrs. Spink's whole thing, the um, the collection of portraits I did of this um, woman I met. Um, anyway, I met her by accident, and I took her as a, a model. And people ask me, you know, why Mrs. Spinks? Why this, this funny old lady? She's not interesting. Well, it is subversive in that way that it does somebody the honour of an oil painting, whereas most people have oil paintings done are heroes or rich. With Mrs. Spinks, was, were there any other kind of artists that you referenced in the making of that? Yeah, of, of Mrs. Spinks. Yeah, I mean, can you can you recall anything? Just you know. Well, uh, uh, she her, the paintings of her were done in my normal painting style, mm -hmm. as as I would have painted a tree or a rock. But um, I had seen the Kinehouse um, at Kinehouse installation called Brady's Bar um, before I did the room. Okay. Um, and although it is a completely different, they're slightly larger than life size and very heavy and hard, um, cartoonish. 
obviously that released me. I mean, it, it just inhibited me. I, I thought, you know, okay, well, I could do anything these days. Why not do it? You know? Have you ever kind of worked, uh, you know, as closely from one no. work before, anything like this? No. Is it a little bit? Is this project a little bit different? Oh, very different. Before, before yes. Your, yeah. Uh, and a bit baffling too. I mean, quite how to uh, how to change it and comment on it. I mean, it, in a way, it was possibly a hard thing to work from because I consider he d he's done it so well. And the only thing I can think of doing is to do it over again with a different subject matter, the obvious subject subject matter at the moment is refugees from Middle East from Syria etc. Dorsey in Paris once, which uh, caught my eye long before I was sort of really knew who he was. Um, and I was interested in it because I'd, I'd been in Italy a lot, but I hadn't been in France a lot. And I was also knew quite a lot about Renaissance art because I was brought up on it. Um, I belonged to a history of art club at the convent school I went to. And at the weekends, there was a, an enthusiastic nun who used to read Ruskin to us and show us pictures by Renaissance artists and we would collect our favorites. So I saw this um, this plaque by Daumier, which was of a line of refugees. And I was very struck by it because the sculpture was um, a different kind to what I was used to in Renaissance art. This was almost like a, almost like a cubist. And I think it was just came out of him naturally. He wasn't an intellectual, I don't think. Anyway, when I started on this project, I thought I'd try and do a sculpture more in his style in that of the line of refugees because it's very likely the woman in the painting I'm mm. doing the laundress with her burden she's I think she's trying to get home before the rain starts um, or just in a hurry to get back to get on with the washing so that she can earn some money uh, buy some food uh, the, the figure in the painting of the laundress is just a little upright single figure where the child actually is probably tucked closer to the woman. I empathize, I try to empathize when I'm painting with the person I'm painting. Sure. It would be a, a bit of a conceptual piece of work, a different approach for your painting, because you would not, presumably you would not know the Well, I wouldn't know that's right. This is, um, this is one of the struggles I've had, and one of the bits of writing I put in is uh, a few um, paragraphs about my problem with conceptual art, because I, to me, a, a piece of visual art speaks to what you could see without being told. Um, you don't need any words to understand what sure. the Dermio is about. But you, you get the feeling that Dermio did, did see that, oh, yes. did see that oh, person, absolutely. you know, and it's a captured, oh, yes, it's something he saw a real thing, thing which I think is that sort of immediate connection yes. for me with this. Mm. Oh, yes. I mean, he saw it and he understood her predicament, yeah. because he knew the poor he lived in. I've done that. I've looked at the painting and done some drawings of it. I felt I'd get to know the figure better, and then I'd perhaps be able to do my own sort of version freely in paint. So I did some little tiny sculptures in the first scene, which I had they're photographed, and they're in the first, in the first contribution.
and then I did this slightly bigger one, and now I'm doing a, a, a sort of relief, a plaque. Um, it's not far relief, it's quite deep relief actually. And I com was comparing it to um, yeah. a Renaissance one, taken yeah. from the um, Baptistry doors in Florence by Alberti. And yeah. they were considered the sort of peak achievement of the Renaissance. And I don't particularly like them. To me, they're um, rather like um, sort of bronze, I think, um, sculpture versions of paintings or drawings with doll stuff on top. They're more like a stage set. Yeah, okay. The backdrop in, a, in the stage, a curtain, you know, with mm. a bit of sculpture, very, very mm. well, uh, low relief, shallow relief. And then little figures stuck on top. And the, the Dermier one was, all the figures are much more integrated with the background, they're much more close, it's much, it's like somebody who, who does it every day as his own language, he just sort of seems to come out of his fingers, rather the way the paint emerges in his paintings from a sort of Mother background in Yes. And um, see. there are two of the, um, the doors in the baptistry, which is divided into panels with different scenes from the Bible in them. Um, and they leave me a bit cold. And they were considered to be a really peak achievement of the Renaissance. And people raved about them at the time. And then when I saw this Daumier panel in the Dorset of some refugees, very rough, I was intrigued by the difference and the emotional content. And I thought about it and I realised that in fact the um, Alberti backgrounds are not really integrated with the figures. They, or backgrounds like a, a curtain in a stage is a background to the actors. Whereas the Daumier, the background and the figures were all sort of one. They were united partly by his emotion, I think. I think the Renaissance artists were so interested in perspective and space and the mathematical side of learning about how to portray space and the way that lines in perspective portray distance, etc that they became possibly a bit cold. Yes. I think I thought of doing a, trying to do a bar relief of the laundress in the style of Dome's refugees. I thought I'd also give an example of the type of background I was talking about, which I sort of disapprove of in a way. Um, it, it, isn't, it doesn't seem to me, quite, it's a sort of bastard product really in a way, I think. It's from painting. Um, the feel of the clay isn't there. Mm. There's no... Um, in stone you get an imposition from the stone itself, the working of the stone. Um, and in this it's sort of almost like a painting which, in front, you know, with figures in front of it. Um, he, he drew, I mean, two thousands and thousands of political cartoons and must have been drawing every day, all day, all the time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was reading something like 4,000 lithographs he did 4, or something. 4,000 lithographs, I know. Which, there you yeah. actually have to um, sort of plan and have the stone ready and everything. So how many drawings? One doesn't know, but it was obviously a language which just flowed out of him, naturally. Um, so I'm trying to see what the difference is between that type of bar relief and his relief, because it seems to me that he was way ahead of his time without the least bit realizing it. And he tried to be a painter, couldn't make his living as a painter. Didn't he thought he was no good? I, I gather. I read a little book the other day. The letters of um, Mary Rilke, the poet Rilke, to his wife, when he was talking about exhibitions he'd seen 
in Paris and Vienna. And he said there were four domiers in the exhibition. This was in the early 20th century, so uh, he was still being valued, or at last being valued, as a primate painter um, in a serious exhibition. Um, but I thought I might do a 3D object. I've got a, a statue in the, in the house um, made with a, rag, a canvas over a framework, which I'll show you. I thought it might be rather good to do the laundress in cloth. <laughs> if I can, I, I can manage that. I couldn't manage a, a big clay piece these days, but I could do that. So if you like, we can go and look at that statue. And another one I've done in um, plaster bandage which I don't think I'll use because it would need, I wouldn't want it white and it would need painting and I don't think that's suitable. Okay. Yes, he had drawing lessons in the, um, in the respectable school, the respectable teacher. But he um, obviously had a huge talent as well. He didn't draw on the spot apparently. He remembered it all and drew when he got home. Oh, that's they interesting. They say in his, yes, in his biography. Um, that you shouldn't try to do things you haven't seen unless you're a particular kind of artist who is a visionary. Mm -hmm. um, he obviously was a bit, I mean, he obviously hadn't seen Sancho Panza and um, Don Quixote, which he did, uh, lots of paintings on. But he um, he had some kind of interest or passion for that character. I think he probably saw himself as a bit of a Don Quixote. Um, but I think that by Goya's etchings and his uh, horrors of war are so telling, it's because he did actually see them. One of them is called, I saw this. Mm. Um, I, it is important for my two D work too. I always try to to uh, bring the three D onto yeah. it, uh, or, or into my two D work. I, to me, that's the magic of the, um, art. In a way, showing the three D on a, in the two D to me is a bit like showing a sort of ex another. Uh, reality, a deeper reality, in whatever way you can, in a in a three D. So I mean, what is art? Getting, trying to, trying to make sense of reality, trying to capture a bit of reality so that one could can make sense of it, uh, believe in it, uh, sort of um, really enjoy it too. Uh, I, it took me a long time to learn that you can't get, um, you can't find that that sort of super reality that you're looking for, or that meaning in the reality, by looking harder again at the same um, piece of material of the material world, because everything will have changed. The next step. You've got to try and let it hit you. You know, it's just occasionally I see a corner of the world, and I know that you know if I get it exactly as I see it. Of course, it isn't exactly as I see it. Mainly because I've been a wife and mother, and I've had to uh, be in the kitchen doing and cooking and you know then I glance out of the window and it's just looking exactly right and I think oh I'll, I'll, I could do that tomorrow and I set up an, um, an easel or something to hold the canvas in place and a bit of table maybe I do it or maybe I don't but at least I have, feel I have a right to <laughs> as long as I produce supper uh, I've got a right to use the kitchen for, for painting as well as cooking. Yes. In 1950, 
GE7. I had children and then I got an au pair girl and I could pay for a few hours each day when I had an au pair girl. Um, I was four years without painting and I nearly went mad. Living here, I mean, it tormented me for one thing, the beauty of the landscape, the colour of the black and the winter, and the black and white yes. flashes on the river. Do you care where the work goes after it leaves the studio, or do, uh, are, you, are you happy to see it go, or, or do you...? Not always. I'm a bit sad sometimes. The worst is if I'd forgotten to take a photograph of it, and it's sold from a gallery, and they, they've forgotten to take the name of the buyer, oh. which is monstrous, but it's happened to me once or twice. Um, I've got a book with most of the people who, the names of most of the people who bought things direct from me in it. Um, I don't know, where, where did you train? Where did you study? And I went to Camberwell. Okay. Four years at Camberwell and then after I'd had three children in quick succession, one, once the youngest of those three was at school full time, I went back for a year to Camberwell. I had one very good sculpture lesson of a man called Martin. He, I'd been struggling with a portrait, a clay, uh, clay portrait of a boy who I fancied very much. And I wasn't getting anywhere with it. I, I just went on working, working, working. It didn't get any better. And this man came in with a carving knife and he said, I've got to run, conceive it in space. Slash, slash, slash. And it immediately looked like my, my boyfriend. So I learned from him how the less is the more, especially mm. in, in sculpture, I think. well, probably in painting too. Less is more. Uh, all my detail was quite unnecessary. Then I had a good lesson from Victor Passmore, who right. said, Make it sing. That's right. You're getting some colour there, make it sing. That was all right. And then Carl's chief said, well, you can draw. And that was a good lesson because I knew I could draw then. Great. Well, thank you, Eleanor, very much for letting us into your studio. You're very welcome. Thank you for listening to me. Letting me